that's uh, for, for archival purposes as well as for anyone that would like to, to watch this but couldn't attend it in this particular hour. So um, it's my, as I say, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. We, we've uh, started this uh, executive leadership lecture series um, in the fall of 2020. Um, so uh, we, we have one or two of these a semester. So these are, uh, uh, you know, premier lectures sort of thing. And I think we've got an outstanding choice of someone to speak to us today. Uh, speaker today is James Golombo. He is uh, uh, president and CEO of the Viking Group. Uh, he has a, almost 40 years of experience in the fire protection industry, uh, including both contracting and, and the manufacturing. He has over 70 uh, patents or his name is attached to over 70 patents. Um, and that was that was part of the draw for my invitation to James that what's it take to, to bring a new product to market? How do you have that vision to get started with that? Um, he's the current chair of the NFP Standards Council. I, and James and I had a little overlap with Standards Council back, back several years ago. Um, and he also serves on the ANSI Executive Standards Council. He's a past member of Board of Trustees for the Fire Protection Research Foundation as well as uh, the members in, in an assortment of boards and councils, active, of course, in AFSA and NFSA and the, and the International Fire Sprinkler Association. Uh, perhaps most notably, I want to identify this is James's birthday. So he's celebrating his birthday with us and giving this lecture. And thanks so much, James, for that. So uh, without further ado, James, I'll turn this over to you. highlights as well as to sit on the board of visitors uh, by invitation of uh, Dr. Milkey and uh, spend a lot of time with very distinguished alumni of the University of Maryland. So it's a pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure to speak to you about advancing technologies in a highly regulated world. Um, I'm sure there are some people out there that may have some ideas or, or maybe think they're gonna change the world relative to a suppression or an idea in fire protection technology. And I wanna give you some insight of how we would bring that forward um, in a highly regulated world. And what, what does it take? I've done this for 40 years. So I've got a little bit of experience on it and I have a, a number of patents as Dr. Milky uh, referred to. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of where these ideas are generated from, how they come about in fire protection in my world. I'm going to go through some of the ideas of patented technologies and what does it take to get it through the regulation process and when, how, how fast does it become part of the average use in the industry. And some of these, some of these points of information may surprise you. Um, you may agree or disagree. Most of what I'm going to tell you is my opinion after 40 years of experience. So you can take that for, uh, for, for, for my value of what I bring here to the table for you today, but highly regulated on my own opinion on this process. So, so the first thing is, you know, great ideas in fire suppression. They're all over the map. It, it, it could be water mist. It could be regulating fire with uh, sound. Uh, it could be with electronic uh, suppression mixed with the detection and flame. There's a whole bunch of technologies going on today. And James, I'm, I'm sorry, James, can we, can we hold on just a minute? Um, we have lost your screen oh. somehow. If you're, if you're showing your screen, the, the, we uh, are, the slides, we are, we are showing apparently they're rebooting. So, okay. Um, right. Go ahead. Then. Can you see me or you just lost the, the slide presentation? Yeah, please? we've lost, lost everything. Uh, uh, at, okay. At this point, we can hear you fine. And there's a, uh, a black square that has your name in it, but that's that's all we're <laughs> that's all we're seeing right now. Okay, well, uh, I I think I can describe the the next slide or two and just what we're going through, and then my team here in the background is going to get this uh, presentation back up for us. Um, but ideas in fire suppression, you know, where where do they come from? And in in my history, I come I come from a background. I worked for a contractor for ten years, and I worked for the manufacturer for the next thirty years. Um, you don't wake up in the middle of the night in this industry and, and invent something or figure out the next best way to do something because it came to you in an epiphany from, from a dream. Um, one of the key things that you have to do is listen to the voice of customer. The voice of customer uh, identifies key elements of problems. And we're going to talk about that, about what do you listen to? What do you listen from? When you're talking to your customers about what are their needs, what, what they have 
in front of them or what are their problems that they're facing they're very very free to give you that information they're not inventing something but the solution to that can be uh, invaluable to the industry uh, many many people have business development personnel and they go out and talk to engineering firms and end users business development uh, people can be a great resource salespeople salespeople are out in the field every day and they're seeing the uh, the grassroots of the industry they see their the uh, uh, people installing systems, the people designing systems, they're in their offices. Um, it's a great resource uh, for what they're presenting. Now they took my screen away, so I'm uh, a little bit without my presentation. But the voice of customer primarily comes from people in the industry that are giving you information about their challenges every day. And their challenges are, are multiple. And in the ability to uh, listen to those challenges and develop products and solutions around them is what brings innovation to the table. I'm waiting for my team here just for. Yeah, there's no, no hurry on our end, James, if you want to take a minute to allow that to boot up. I see the, uh, I see the window screen is all I see. <laughs> Just bear with us for one second here. I apologize. Nancy, you just want to bring the presentation and I'll keep going with the presentation until the screen comes back up. Okay. So uh, sales personnel, as I, as I said, for the resource of information. Okay, now they have the screen back up in front of me. Jim, can you see that screen? Uh, no, yeah, I can't. Okay, and the camera's not on. Okay, uh, and then with the, uh, with the sales personnel, then your engineering research and development, obviously they're trying to test technology and they're trying to uh, bring new innovation. So they, they are a great resource for innovation ideas. The industry end users, those are the ones who have to apply these standards and build buildings around regulations. So they bring technology to you or problems to you that you can develop solutions. And my favorite is the local bar. Uh, the local bar is where you bring your customers and listen to their problems and they're more free to give you uh, what their challenges are. And that can be a great resource for listening to and, and developing solutions. So I have a quote that I use for myself. Um, I have my name on over 72 patents globally in the fire suppression field. Not one of these were generated from a creative thought of my own. All of these were solutions to problems provided by others and solved by a team. That's my quote, I'm sticking to it. Uh, with with my name on all these patents, I've never had that epiphany moment, uh, you know, waking up from a dream or that shower conversation with myself that uh, I'm going to change the world with the new innovation. But I have developed solutions in that manner by listening to people, by listening to that voice of customer, then bringing that solution to the market. Jim, are we live with you now on the screen? We are. We are good. Um, the the uh... All right. Quality of the, there we go. Now it's it's uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully we got that resolved there. Yes. So, in innovation. So let's talk about what is innovation and what is iteration. So, it's it's highly distinguished of what is patentable and what has value, and what is obvious and obvious to anyone in the industry of where we go next. So iteration, again, it's obvious and expected. It's easy to budget for it because su success is expected immediately because it's you already know where you are and an iteration is a small change to that to move forward. The return on investment is clearly understood because you know if you make a small change to it, you know what the industry is already doing with an idea and you, you have a very clear understanding of where it's going to go. Very rarely does an iteration include changing standards or codes to accept it because it's already regulated. 
So therefore, a small iteration to it is easily understood and easily accepted by authority having jurisdiction or insurance companies. And company alignment is simple because everyone on board knows what you're talking about because an iteration is very simple to explain. It's what we're doing today with a small change that the industry will obviously accept. So iteration is not innovation. Iteration is not patentable because it's an obvious next step and is very clear as to the direction. Innovation is difficult. Customers don't know they need it. You go out there and do a voice of customer and you say, I'm gonna develop something you've never heard of, never used, never had a need for. So they didn't know it was available. So you're not gonna get a good feedback from customers directly when you say, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna go 10 feet higher in storage, or I'm gonna change the, the way we store material. I'm gonna change the way we suppress material. Um, what they're doing is fine to them. What they're doing has been acceptable for many years. They don't know why you need to change it. Codes and standards revisions takes a long time. I have an example that I'll talk about a little later. It took me 20 years to uh, convince NFPA 13 to eliminate the area density curves. Um, there's a lot of competing interests and things on codes and standards, and we'll talk about that in that regulating the innovation idea. Return on investment is speculative. You could develop a new product and you know it's gonna replace a legacy product. It's gonna replace it across the board. You'd be surprised, it sometimes takes five to 10 years for customers to change the way they do business. They've been doing business for the same way a long time. They're slow to change. It's good for when you get them to accept your product because they're so slow to change going away from it, but it's also a problem of getting a return on investment for innovation and fire protection because I, I tell people it takes five to 10 years for a new product idea or a new system idea in the fire protection world to be accepted and used on a regular basis. So you can imagine um, cell phone technology every six months or other, other electronic technologies changing every six months because they have to. That's the that's a cycle time of, of innovation in, in electronics and, and another world. But in fire protection, it can be five to 10 years for that return on investment. And there'll always be naysayers. There'll always be, be people to say it's the system's not broke. It doesn't need to be fixed. And uh, they can be blockers. They can be blockers in the code arena. They could be blockers in the market arena or insurance in industry um, just because they just don't believe that change was necessary. So that's always, always going to be a challenge for us. The rules of innovation. Fire protection. Number one, better does not sell. It took me four or five products to understand this because I knew that what I was developing was a better product. It provided better suppression, better protection, uh, better coverage. And all of a sudden, I found out that the industry was not using it. Um, and I'm going to go through a little bit about better doesn't sell, but the minimum standard in the code compliance is the competitor. So if the minimum standard says an inferior product or an inferior system is acceptable because it was the state of the art at the time, that's your competitor. It's not the better fire protection. It's not the better suppression that you're developing. The competitor is the legacy codes and standards of people that say, it's not broke. I don't see why I have to improve it. Uh, some economic benefit combined with the superior performance is the key. You need to have some economic hook that it's faster, that it makes more sense for your direct customer or the end user that they're going to specify the use of that material because there has to be an economic benefit to change from the legacy to push innovation through fire protection. I can develop a suppression sprinkler for residential. It's not necessary. We're perfectly fine with our life safety system and our very light densities and our very low cost residential systems in single family homes and it's going to help advance the technology. Can I develop a better protection product? Yes, I can. Can I put the fire out faster? Yes, I can. All of them have an economic negative impact where the standards say this level is acceptable, therefore that's my competitor. If I wanna do something in single family homes, I've gotta compete with something that the standard already says, very light, very economical system is acceptable Developing something with electronics or detection or flame detection, earlier suppression for better life safety would be a very difficult process because it doesn't have economics behind it. 
So rule number one, better does not sell. I'll give you an example. About 20 years ago, developed uh, working with a gentleman by the name of Chet Shermer, Shermer Engineering. And uh, Chet wanted uh, dry residential. And to do that, I had to have an accelerator on a dry valve that would operate in around three seconds. So we developed a technology called an electronic accelerator and it operated a dry valve in three seconds. A traditional, the legacy, which you see here, um, was a mechanical accelerator, not an electronic accelerator. The mechanical accelerator, as you can see in here, has 28 moving parts. It takes a high level of maintenance, takes a high level of everything to be exactly right for it to function in the field. Now to think about to put this on a single family home that doesn't have all the regulatory maintenance standards that a commercial building does, it was just not going to happen. So we developed the electronic accelerator, which you see over on, on your left. Um, that ex electronic accelerator was great. We developed it at the same cost platform as the mechanical accelerator. And we thought the industry was going to just go crazy over this because it was faster. It was three and a half seconds. It was more dependable. It didn't have 28 moving parts. It just had a pressure transducer. Similar unit cost, we put it out at the same cost as a mechanical accelerator. What we didn't realize with the minimum standard compliance is the competitor because it did not have a cost advantage. So without a cost advantage, what we found was that we had not revolutionized the market as anticipated. We thought every mechanical accelerator was gonna go away and people were gonna only use electronic accelerators. It is used in niche applications where time is ultra sensitive. It is four or five seconds faster in more, most cases. So it has some niche applications, but it didn't replace the mechanical accelerators because the speed of installation without electrical was the key. They didn't wanna install the elect electricity to the device and there was no long-term serviceability equation for the customer. And what we didn't realize was the customer was not the end user. The end user was gonna benefit from this, but it was the installing the contractor that made the choice of which type of accelerator they were going to use. And the installing contractor said, okay, I can install a mechanical accelerator and be done. As soon as I put it in place, I'm done. I can get my certi certificate of occupancy and I don't have to wait for anybody. The electronic accelerator was put into place and somebody had to hook up electrical cables to it. Now you had another trade involved. We missed the market by not understanding that the customer that we were selling to was the contractor who was making the choice of which accelerator they were gonna use and not the end user who was gonna benefit from a long-term sustainability of the product and less maintenance problems with that product. So again, we didn't understand who the customer was. We didn't have an economic advantage for the contractor to decide that they were going to do that. So we put a lot of money into it and it's a good product. There's nothing wrong with the product, but it didn't revolutionize the market the way that we thought it was going to because we had chose the wrong customer base. It was, it was the contractor who was gonna make the decision. So the best innovations, Solve a problem that most people cannot see. They're not obvious. We've talked about that a little bit. Innovations must provide some economic benefit or simplicity over the current art. So if you're gonna get people to change and you want people to change to your technology, uh, back when we developed the extra large orifice sprinklers or the K25 ESFRs, the bigger, the bigger horse uh, sprinkler protection, attic sprinklers or whatever it was, it had to have some economic benefit to the customer. And the sooner you figure out who's buying your product and why they're going to buy it, then that innovation has to provide some economic benefit for them or simplicity over the current art, simplicity over the way it's being done today that makes that innovation attractive. Understand who the customer will be before you invest. Um, the, good, the example of the accelerator that I just mentioned to you was us not understanding who our customer was in that particular instance. So sometimes it will be the end user. Sometimes the end user has no other alternatives. We talk a lot about rack storage in our industry today, and there's a lot of automated storage rack systems out there. And the, you know that customer base is those ASR rack manufacturers who wanna sell their product. 
uh, and their systems into these buildings. And there's a lot of them individually out there, but they are the customer base because they're going to say how to protect their product. And it may not be the, the installing contractor or the design firm um, earlier on in the project. So understand who that customer base is. Great intellectual property attorneys are essential. If you're an innovator, if you want to bring innovation into the fire protection industry, and I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, that it's a five to a 10 year process of adoption of a technology into the regular world of fire, fire suppression. So during that five to 10 years, what it does is gives a great opportunity for your competitors or people with like minds to develop or even improve your invention or improve your ideas before you ever have the advantage of the market, the advantage of the sale of that product or that idea into the market because of the time that it takes in the regulated industry. So great intellectual property attorneys are essential. You need to learn the game of disclosure and confidential work product. If we're sitting in a bar and uh, you tell me your greatest idea, um, you are publicly disclosing that. You'll learn real fast if you're an innovator to what a non-disclosure non form is or a confidentiality agreement. And you have to have those in place before you start talking to people about your idea. Uh, there, there are laws relative to intellectual property that when you disclose it, it becomes public domain. There's different laws in different countries. So you just have to have great intellectual property attorneys. If you want to generate an idea, invest an idea and bring it to the fire protection industry, I highly suggest you find great intellectual property attorneys and they will guide you through that process. So rule number two, great intellectual property. Property rights granted by the government, whichever government that you're dealing with in whichever whatever country, it gives you exclusive. It gives you the exclusive of the owner to prevent others from making, using, and selling, or importing the claimed invention. There's a couple of different types of patents, uh, utility, design, and plant. I give you a website that you could link onto with this presentation um, and look up these definitions of different types of patents. Most, most in fire protection and utility and design. The purpose of the patent system is to reward the inventors and thereby encourage innovation. So the patent is there to make this information public so that people can enjoy practicing it, enjoy learning from it and expanding on it, but you get the exclusive right. It makes it economically feasible to invest and money in research and development, because if you have 20 years of protection in a, in a utility patent, for an example, you can spend two or $3 million up front for getting your product through the laboratories and getting it into the system because you'll have 20 years of protection of the exclusive right to make that product, um, to promote and disclose inventions. So the disclosure of inventions is important in our industry because you learn from what other people have, have knowledge of, that they're publishing, and you can actually use patented material in another application or another use and actually file for intellectual property of patented things. I'll give you an example a little later uh, with improvements. Doesn't mean that you have a right to the original patent. Uh, you have to negotiate that with the patent holder, but you can make improvements on that patent and actually file for more intellectual property and work together with the original inventor. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, advantages of the patent system. Um, you know, primarily, the patentee gets the right to exclude others for a fixed length of time, 20 years from the date of application for a utility patent, for an example. The public gets the advantage of a full disclosure of the, the inventor's best idea how to make the product and use the invention. So the public gets the advantage of seeing this. It's not a trade secret. It's not in the back house operation of some file. It's out in the public domain that you could see everything about that invention. The inventor's teaching you how to make it. They're disclosing all of the claims and all of the, uh, the background information of how that product is made, how that product is bought to market and how it differentiates from the prior art of technology that's out there. So, the public gets smarter about it because they get to read the full disclosure of the inventors and the inventor gets 20 years of exclusive right to make that product. So there's some myths 
out there about patents. A patent provides the right to make use and sell an invention. No, that's not correct. Patent is a right to exclude others from making and using and selling the invention. So your patent is your enforcement. It says, do not come into my market, do not make my product. I have a patent on that. And if you do infringe, then I have the right to uh, file a lawsuit and uh, stop you from making that product. Um, it's not an affirmative right to practice the inventions. Other may own patents that cover some aspect. That's what I started to talk about a little bit, and I'll show you an example. So the coat hanger. I invent a coat hanger, and a coat hanger com comprising a hook and a frame. So you kind of know what it looks like. I invented it. I've got 20 years protection. I can make a coat hanger. Sally comes around and discovers an improved coat hanger. She adds the clips to the frame to hang pants from. Okay, so that's a, that's a use of an invented product in another application. She gets a patent on the clips, but it does not give her the right to make the hanger in the first place. But it does prevent James from adding clips to his coat hanger because that would be infringing Sally's patent. So you can take a patented product and you can advance it forward and file for innovation, even though you didn't invent the original product, um, you can use it in other applications and get patents yourself. It promotes working with the original inventor and collaborating and licensing and commercializing together um, if, if both patents have value. So patents are interesting, but again, all of this seems very simple, the way that I'm presenting it, and it's very complicated in the legal world, uh, but great patent counsel will, uh, will help guide you through the process and what is, what is inventive and what is not. So the second myth about patents, is we don't copy anyone's products so we don't infringe. We never, we never went to a copy machine and copied someone's product and made the same product. So you know we came up with it ourselves, so we can't infringe anything. Not the case. Many patented inventions are not commercialized. So again, having good counsel that can do infringement study or background search of prior art uh, is very important in fire suppression because there's many patents that are that are actually filed and issued that may be not commercialized. So you didn't see it on the market, but there may be a patent that exists or lingering out there that you have to be worried about. Um, so Again, going back to that council, you need someone that's familiar with fire protection that they can go through and do a prior art search of all the patents relative to your area of art. Potential li liability for patent infringement, whether you know about it or not, uh, can go back to when you first started making that product and you could have a couple of years of infringement uh, under current law without you ever knowing that you violated a patent. So if you're bringing new products to the market, if you're bringing new innovations to the market, Always very important to have good counsel that can keep you out of harm's way relative to the, uh, the patent um, process. Merely having a patent, hey, I have a patent, and it's gonna stop all others from copying my, my product. And that's just not the case. Um, you must enforce the patent in court to hold others accountable for infringing behavior. So if I made uh, this lapel microphone, and I think that I uh, own it because I patented it. The US government gave me a patent on it and someone else comes in from overseas and copies my microphone exactly the same way. They can do that. There's nothing to stop them from doing that. The only thing to stop them from doing that is me to take them to court with my patent, enforce my patent, win that court case against them and their infringement and only then can I stop them from making that product. So just having a patent is not going to stop someone from copying. Enforcing that patent is going to stop them from copying you, and then you'll have your rights. Um, but the fear of liability of infringement may stop some competitors and create licensing opportunities. In my experience, most, most um, patents in the fire protection field are licensed between manufacturers. Uh, it's negotiated. Many of us know each other. We all of our R and D departments know each other. Um, so there's, I, it can go all the way to a jury trial and create liability. Very few of them do. A lot of them get negotiated before they ever make it to a jury trial. But 
that fear of liability may stop some people from copying you directly. The benefits of a, of a patent portfolio is a competitive advantage. It excludes competitors from the best products or the most efficient process. It increases the competitor's risk of level of uncertainty. So if they're gonna invest this lapel microphone, if they're gonna invest a quarter of a million dollars to make that exact copy, do they, are they certain they're not gonna violate my intellectual property? Are they certain they're not gonna lose the lawsuit against them and just waste $250,000 where they find out that they're not allowed to make a lapel microphone? Um, it can be a bargaining chip to exchange other, other intellectual property with companies between each other. Scarecrow effect, that's uh, you're putting up the scarecrow in the field just to keep the crows out um, from passive enforcement. They're just afraid of your patent portfolio. There's a prestige to have a patent. Um, the prestige is that you're an industry leader investing in the industry and that the more patents that you have in your portfolio and that your company brings to the table, uh, the more innovative that company is and more people wanna be around you. Licensing revenue, um, that would be mostly between the manufacturers. The great benefits to the patent. Um, when you have an idea, whether it's patentable or not, even if it's novel, the invention is not patentable if it differs from the prior art only in an obvious modification. So they always, they always tell me and when I'm being deposed, uh, one of ordinary skill in the art. Is it obvious to them? Is it obvious to take a valve and use it for the next application? Um, and would anyone in the industry of ordinary skill in the art be able to make that leap? without thinking about it, without thinking there was obstacles or challenges, that that was just an obvious way. Highly subjective to make that determination, but it's a very strong defense in patentability is whether something was obvious or not. Patents can take up to three years to obtain. They're expensive. They're expensive to generate. You're probably gonna spend, depending on the complexity, you could spend anywhere from $10,000 to a half a million dollars to generate a patent and to get it right and get all the families and continuations and the process of patent technology. Um, I see these 1-800 patent commercials and you know for $500, they'll file a patent for you. You, you probably will get $500 worth. Um, I wouldn't wanna to go to court with a lot of those, but uh, uh, they're expensive to generate and get good counsel. It's exciting to receive a patent. You see your name on a patent, you get a little glass plaque and you put it on your wall and you say, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an inventor. But they're useless unless you can enforce them. You can, ha you can have as many patents as you want on your wall. They're, 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 they take a while to get, they're expensive to generate and you can, you can plaster your entire wall with patents. But unless you enforce them, unless it's preventing someone from making your product, then they're useless. And the patents are extremely expensive to enforce. In my world, in manufacturing and fire protection of an automatic sprinkler, I budget three to $4 million in patent defense every time I have an issue that I think is going to go to, go to court. So it's three to $4 million just to defend the patent that I obtained on the investment that I made in the product first, in the patent second, and then three to $4 million of the enforcement that's gonna be on top of that. So, you know, I, I get phone calls all the time. I have a patent. I, I want to work with you. I want to work with your company to make my product. I said, okay, have you enforced your patent? Have you gone to court with your patent? No, I have not. Okay, so it's a great piece of paper on the wall. Let's take it from there. Let's Now let's do the background research and see if it has legs underneath it. And will I invest three to $4 million in your idea or your patent to go defend it against one of the competitors? So some of the steps that you'll go through in the value chain, uh, whether a patent portfolio is worth bringing to the market. Be patient. This is, this is part of that regulated world. You've got a great idea. You've got great product. You don't understand why the industry just doesn't run to you and, and, throw themselves at your feet and say, you're the smartest person in the world. And uh, we, why, where were you five years ago? Um, the approval agencies are probably not going to have a standard to test your innovation. If it truly is innovation, if it's not iterative, 
If it's not the logical next step, it probably doesn't exist in the laboratories. So you have to convince the laboratories how to test, what to test, and what that information is gonna be brought to the applicable standards. Because the standards are not gonna have a black and white guidance for its application. So many HJs, many, many insurance companies say, yeah, I really need to see it in NFPA 13 before you can apply this in, in the sprinkler world. I need really need to see it in NFPA 20 for the fire pump world or, or pick a standard, but they wanna see it in black and white in their adopted standard before they put their name behind it and say that's an acceptable technology. So you gotta learn to be patient to get your ideas into the process before that authority having jurisdiction is going to say, I'll accept that because it's in the standard. And I'll give you some examples of how to do that. And your first months, years, sales are going to disappoint you. Um, I try to explain it to people of equity people coming into the fire protection market and everyone wants to see an 18 month return on investment or a 24 month return on investment for a stretch. <laughs> it says just, it's just the wrong industry to have those expectations. We're not the cell phone, electronic laptop uh, technology. We are the suppression industry. And in the suppression industry, it's a five to 10 year return on investment from these, from these products that are being brought to market because of what I'm gonna talk about, because of what I'm gonna talk about in the highly regulated world of being patient. So you have a new idea and I'm gonna put fire sprinkler up here, but put your own idea up there. Um, it could be a new suppression method. It could be a new fire hose. It could be a new fire hydrant. I don't care what it is, but your idea is up here. It's not addressed by the standards. What now? The first thing you do is you take it in for testing because you're going to have to have some test data to prove that your idea is more than an idea. There's not a whole bunch of people are going to change standards around an idea. They're going to change standards and criteria around performance. So the first thing is testing. Meet with the lab. Meet with a testing lab. ULFM, good examples, could be VDS in Germany, it could be LPC in England, it could be CCCF in uh, China. Um, convince, ask and beg them to test your device. You, you are bringing in an idea they've never seen before. They're not comfortable. They got brands. They, the, the integrity of their marks are very important to them. So they don't wanna put their mark on something that doesn't perform. So they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna test that product probably to more rigorous standards than the legacy product ever went through that you're replacing. The legacy has the grandfather clause. It's accepted, it's in black and white. They have very little liability to it. But when you bring in a new idea to a lab such as UL and FM, and you're saying, this is different, is completely different in its performance, they're probably gonna hold it to a higher standard. So most of the innovations that you've seen over the past 15 to 20 years, are actually at a higher level than the legacy products that they're replacing. When you have that testing, you have to now start the process of submitting it to the standards. For a fire sprinkler, it would be to NFPA 13. If the process is successful, it could take up to three years. NFPA 13 is in a three-year cycle. If you get the right product, the right test data, you submit it to 13 and 13 says, we agree with you and we're gonna put that in our standard, it could be up to three years before that standard hits the street. And you're not done there because that's not state law. In the United States, you have to wait for that NFPA 13 edition to be adopted by your building code of your state, county, and or city. That can take up to nine years for that edition of NFPA 13 to be adopted by your model building code. So I'll show you on my last slide, uh, some of the existing states as of this year. Some of them are in 2012 edition of their building the code. So they're out of the 2010 edition of NFPA 13, not the 13, 16, 19, or 22 edition. Four, four editions have come out, but those building codes adopt an earlier version. So you need to be patient because the standard is going to reference it black and white. You're going to feel pretty good by having the latest edition of 13 in your hand but you're gonna have an HJ that has an older book in their hand and say, this is my law and it's not in that standard. So when you get it in this standard, my law, then I'll accept it. Now there are exceptions to that. And I'm gonna talk about how you need to bring that to market. When the stars are aligned, everything is aligned. 
standard and code re recognition takes five years to adopt into a state standard. That's what I bank on. I bank on about five years because we're always in a cycle. You know you're innovating something, usually when 13 is going into cycle or our standard 20 is going into cycle. So you can submit something, put a blocker in there. The strategy of code development is a strategy just like new product development. So you need to be able to be participating with those standards and uh, start your process early to get a five-year adoption into a state code. When you go to UL, UL will provide you with a test report. Now, this is important. FM, the UL report is the, the test report, not an approval for NFPA. It's a test report of your technology that you're using to submit to NFPA um, or an authority having jurisdiction. I'll explain why you submit that to an authority having jurisdiction. FM is a little bit different. FM will test the product if it has value to their insured clients. FM is an insurance carrier inherently. Their, their primary business is insurance, but they will test product if there's value to their client. They'll issue immediate standards. They can, they can change their standards at their will. They don't have to have a three-year cycle or a regulated ANSI cycle. Um, so they can do immediate standards recognition. So that's why some, of, some, some technologies go through FM first, just because the client will get immediate uh, application into their product into the insured world. And you have to submit it as an equivalent method into the NFPA process, which I'll talk about next. This is a lot of font, but I just copied this out of the International Fire Code. The codes and standards have the right to use alternative arrangements, alternative materials, or equivalent technologies. You have to find them. You have to have the resources to submit alternative methods to the authority having jurisdiction or whoever's reviewing or accepting your new idea as an equivalent method to the, what the standards currently say. So the International Fire Code in section 10410 has alternative methods and designs of construction and equipment. And it asks for research reports and test results. And that's what you're doing with the laboratory. You're bringing those research results and test reports. You're submitting them to that local building committee as an equivalent method. So that way of getting that return on investment faster into the fire protection world does have avenues such as the International Fire Code. It does have avenues in standards like NFPA 13. In section 1.5, the equivalency says nothing in the standards intended to prevent the use of systems, methods, or devices of equivalent or superior quality. The lab is establishing that report. They're establishing that test report saying this is doing as good as or better than the legacy product. And therefore, in accordance with this section, if it's submitted as an equivalent, with the background of the technical documentation and the test results can be accepted by that authority having jurisdiction into their current edition as law. So the current edition might be the 2010 edition of NFPA 13. This statement is in the 2013 edition or 2010 edition. Therefore, the authority has the right to accept your technology if you have all the appropriate data. So again, with the International Fire Code, with the NFPA standards that regulate most of the product installations have this equivalency standard and it's not in every standard, but it's in many of them. Um, this is an avenue to bring your test results. And I, and I tell people, get ready to hit the road because you have to go out there and sell this information. Um, the industry is not gonna come to you all the time and say, what do you have? What do you have that I can use? What do you have new that I can use? You've got to go out there and do SFPE presentations. You have to do fire uh, marshals associations, you have to do trade shows and tie in with whatever industry association you can to do presentations on your idea, your testing, your results, to get people excited about it, that they will go to the extra effort to submit it as an equivalent method or another way of doing design so it's accepted. Once you have all that, you're going into the NFPA 13. You think this is a slam dunk. I got, I got good test results. It's great. It should be accepted. What you have to realize is what the ANSI process is for NFPA 13. There's 30 representatives from different interest groups. They strongly believe in their existing standards. It requires data to make a change. They wanna see data from a nationally recognized lab. 
before they will make a change to their standard. And you may have competing interests. You may have people on that committee that uh, don't think that's a good idea just because they have competing products. But the value of NFPA is that no more than one third will be from any interest group. So you have, you have two thirds from other interest groups at a minimum. Uh, so you shouldn't have too much of a problem, but you gotta realize uh, you may have people they, on the committee that uh, don't think your idea is a good idea because of product defense, not necessarily fire protection standards, but that's why we have balanced committees in the NFPA process. And the committee can reject your work. They can approve it or modify your submission. So just because you have the idea, just because you have the product, you go in with your design protocol and say, this is how we want you to apply it. The NFPA is, may modify that. They may just reject it. They may say, you, you didn't do enough testing. And we don't think it's applicable into our standard. And you're half a million dollars into it already. So you gotta be, you gotta be proactive. You gotta be participating on these committees. Um, know the process. Know how to, know how to uh, have your representation heard. Code adoption, okay, we talked about it in the USA. The IBC, the IFC is the uh, state model building code that adopts the NFPA standards. I just pulled the 22 uh, review of the IBC and I pulled out a couple just to give you an example. So Indiana down here is out of the 2012 international building code. So at best, they're gonna have the 2010 edition for NFPA 13 and that will be their law. So anything, anything of any advancement that's in the 2016, 19, or 22 edition has to be submitted as an equivalent method to their current law in Indiana. So you need to get people and your customers excited about your idea so that they'll go to the extra effort with your help, with your data and your information to get an equivalent method. So with that, better doesn't always sell. You might have the best idea in the world. You might have the best way of putting fire out. Um, I like the oxygen reduction system as a great example. It, you can't have a fire. If you reduce the oxygen level down to a certain point in the building, you don't have people in there. You can't even light a match. It's perfect. You just can't start a fire. It's expensive. It's hard to maintain. Uh, it doesn't have a backup system. It doesn't have a fire department connection. There's a whole bunch of things to it, but it's a great idea, but it doesn't sell because it doesn't have the economic benefit and it gets expensive. Great intellectual properties or attorneys are important. They have your back, they keep you, they guide you, they keep you out of trouble and they keep your path aligned with your company um, policy. Be patient. If you're in the fire protection world, the fire protection industry just doesn't run and embrace you for every change that you make. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes effort. You gotta go out there and sell that idea. You gotta continue to sell that idea every opportunity you get. The more active you are involved, the more people know your network, it becomes easier to do over time. But uh, go out there and be aggressive with these. And Jim, with that, um, I think I left 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you today and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have for me. All right, James, thanks very much. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, the um, Let's see if we can't, um, can't get some questions for you. Um, the, uh, let's see, my, my chat window is not, let me go to another computer here, because my chat window isn't showing any, I thought I saw one question come up. So um, here, here's a question from one of the attendees, uh, James, that asked, uh, this falls into the, uh, the alternative methods uh, discussion, I think where, where you just were, is uh, the question is, do performance-based code standards allow for innovation to be more successful? More successful? Is more successful good? is the question, but I yeah. mean. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, performance-based okay. is, is really looking at the, the, the outcome of the event, the, the, total, the total package of it, not the standards and the application, but you're looking at the total package. And if an innovation is integral of that result of performance-based standards, then it's easier to sell because you're selling the performance base as a package. And if that innovation is built into there, it's part of that equation. So yes, some of these innovations are easier to sell in the performance-based uh, model than it is in the standards model because the standards model, very prescriptive, 
go left, go right, go straight under these circumstances. And if you're going to do something different, you got to prove it in this in this small area. And the performance um, the performance based standards that entire package brings the whole thing together. So it's all sold as one package. So yes, it does. It is easier in in that arena. All right, thank you. Here's, here's another question. Uh, it's from uh, Jack Poole. He asks, what is the average cost to develop a, a new patent? Um, a good patent, a, a good patent. A patent with a, with a backbone, a portfolio, continuing applications, probably in the neighborhood of $250,000 to $500,000. And, and and that and that's one you're willing to go to court over. That's one that you know that you have a defensible position. You can get you can get patents, like I said, at ten thousand um, dollars. But you got to go to court and you got to prove that to twelve people that couldn't get out of jury duty for the day. Uh, that that gets difficult at best. So uh, you got to have a good patent portfolio, continuing applications. I know I'm, I'm probably going too far with patents, but uh, just because you get your first patent doesn't mean you're done. You got to keep thinking of other iterations and other improvements that you're making to that portfolio. So you have continuing applications that continue on from that first patent generation. So that first patent generation may cost you fifty to sixty thousand dollars, but those continuations and keeping that attorney involved with that family of patents it gets expensive. But those are the best ones that have six or seven patents to a family. When, when you a little follow up there, two, we have, I've got a follow up question for each of the questions I've already presented to you. Um, the one for that quarter million to half a million dollars to develop a patent, uh, where's most of it go? Is that attorney fees or where? where's most? Where, yeah. You know, where's yeah, that not, go? Not a lot of it goes to the government. Um, when I when I see those bills come in, it's like a two hundred dollar filing fee, and I'm like, okay, wait a minute, that that came in a two uh, twenty five thousand dollar invoice. Um, it goes, it mostly goes to the attorneys. Okay. So back to the performance based design issue, then, um, where where there's tremendous advantages for you in putting an innovative uh, product out and getting it used. Question is um, with with performance based design, then what's the hang up with innovation within performance based design? Uh, what's the barricade? Uh, familiarity of an authority having jurisdiction who has kind of they don't have ultimate liability because they're an HJ, as you well know in the fire protection engineering community. They have a lot of protection, but they got to have some justification as to why they accept something. So if you put too much innovation into a performance based standard, things they are not familiar with. They get more uncomfortable. Uh, if that answers the question properly, if you take known science and you combine two or three of them together for a performance-based outcome that had not been regulated before, they, they kind of know those existing science. They, they know those existing pat or portfolios of, of products. But when you're using something that's never been used before and trying to sell it as a performance base, you sort of have that that second area of raised eyebrow that am I doing the right thing by accepting this? So it can be more difficult using an innovation and performance base, but that's what performance based is. You're taking the latest information, the latest technology, and you're, you're trying to come with an outcome um, of, uh, of safety of life, safety of, uh, of property. Uh, I, but I understand the HJ perspective. I understand, understand the insurance perspective because an insurance carrier has got to pay for a loss. And all they have is on paper, all your best ideas of performance-based suppression or performance-based outcome. And they don't have 10 years of history of that new innovation that you used in that, in that model. So you get, you, get, you get some raised eyebrows when you're using innovation inside of that mm -hmm. versus existing uh, technologies that you're putting together. Good, good question. Um, Question that I had for you with um, so outside of the regulatory challenges and working through through that, um, how how much the, of getting a, an innovation accepted by the customer is you having to convince them of what they need? Kind of thinking of the Apple success story of telling people what you know you got to have this, and how much of that is 
I guess, marketing and communication, how much of it is the, the actual technology advance? Um, depends on who you're talking to, okay? Uh, and what, what customer level of, uh, of code and advancement and technology that they understand. But I'd, I'd heavily weight it towards marketing, sales, and technical information as to getting that information to them at about 65 to 70%. 30% of the innovation side, if, if they are actively involved, you've got uh, Jack Poole on the line here, and he's a friend of mine on council. Um, he has a, a level of understanding of the regulatory process. Jack and I can have a conversation very quickly and I don't need that 65% of marketing and sales and, and all that information because he, he'll, he'll understand. So it really depends on the audience. Um, Sometimes it's 90% of just the product testing and the innovation and they get it, they get the application. And sometimes we've got to spend a lot of time bringing people on to why do you want to change? Why do you want to stop installing standard spray sprinklers? Why do you want to stop installing valves that don't have electronic features? Um, they've been doing it for a long time. They're making money doing it. And now you're standing in front of them telling them it's time to change. So that level of customer take 65 to 70% of the marketing and sales pitch and less of the technical. They kind of understand, you You probably know the technical, that's not my arena. Tell me why I need to do this. What is it gonna make me money? Is it gonna make me more competitive against the people that are bidding a project against me? Or is it gonna make my end user more competitive against the people they compete with? Because that I can sell. So, so Jim, it's a great question. And the answer varies based on the audience, if, that, okay. if that's clear. All right, uh, uh, one more that I'll, I'll uh, pose to you that, that's been put into the uh, chat here. And then otherwise we could open it up for any any live question. Anybody want to go off mute? How about uh, as uh, Jack Poole has, has one for you also. Uh, so uh, but let, let's ask this one first. Um, the question is, can you discuss the impact of patents being purchased for the purpose of ensuring that a product never comes to market or how to prevent or overcome that impact. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard and seen this in the pharmaceutical side. I don't see it in the fire protection side. We, um, I've never heard of someone in the fire suppression, fire technology, buying or suppressing an invention, not bringing it to market because it competes with another major interest of theirs. I have not heard of that. I see all patents that are issued in the fire protection field. Um, pretty much know all the companies that are generating these intellectual properties and the products that they're producing. But I have heard and seen in pharmaceutical plant and other areas where it's competitive to a major industry. Um, you've heard things in the cell phone. You've heard things um, in some arenas where people suppress ideas and they buy it and put it on a shelf because it's competitors, something that they still have patent portfolio on and they wanna live the life of that patent. So not in fire suppression that I'm aware of, but it does exist in other portfolios outside of our industry. Okay. All right, well, let's let's allow people uh, um, for a couple minutes here that we're, we're sure. at the top of the hour, but if you've got time to go a little past that. I got as much time as you need. Well, appreciate it. Um, let's let's go to, to we'll do hands raised if you would. I'll try and keep an eye between uh, Katie and I. We'll try to keep an eye for hands raised. Jack, you've already expressed an interest in asking live, so so proceed. Yeah, James, great job. Thank you. Um, question: Thinking back to the sprinkler head, let's say uh, somebody develops the first pendant or upright sprinkler. How do you refine how many details you put to that? i.e. I want to have a sprinkler um, and it has a round deflector and it has either a glass bulb or a electronic gizmo that fuses it or some fusible link and it can do all these fancy different um, technologies like extended coverage and how do you eventually allow the other companies that want to have a pendant sprinkler with a glass bulb or other like that I mean it just yeah. seems so confusing because there are so many details. How do you refine the patent to cover all of that? You, it's a great question, Jack. And it's difficult. And this is where the great counsel comes in because 
uh, you count the tines of the deflector, you count the angle of the deflector, the surface area of the deflector, the shape of the wrench, the, the screw boss that goes into the deflector. And you can only protect what you describe and what you teach. So you got to do the background of the invention of why is your invention different than what was done before? Okay, say I went upright. So to go upright, I had to have a bigger deflector and my tines had to come down at a steeper angle than a pendant. Well, okay, what is that angle? What made it different that 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 made it perform? And you got to be able to describe that in the background of the invention because that was the intent. And then in your claims, and you can have as simple as two or three claims, and that's the enforceable part about the patent plus the background. But you could have 35 claims. I, I've seen patents with 80 claims in them. And it says the, the deflector tines that there's 32 tines and they're between five and 10 degrees. And then a subservient claim to that that says it's between 10 degrees and 11 degrees and so on and so on and so on. But your protection is what you can describe and teach in your patent as to why it performs differently. So yeah, you just look at it and you say, I, I really don't understand what makes that patentable. But when you read the definition of the patent and you get into the gap between the tines, the shape of the tines, the angle of the tines, the solid surface area, the, everything that's making it do what you're trying to patent, you have to disclose, teach and claim, then you can defend against it. You can't just say, um, I'm going to fly to Mars. Okay, that's great. You can't get a patent on that. You got you to start going through the process and what, what's going to make your invention of flying to Mars obtainable. You can't just have something so overly broad that you can't teach it. You're not teaching anyone how to do that. So you have to teach people how to make that deflector, how to make that sprinkler. Um, and that's the advantage of the public. That's the advantage of what I talked about with patents is that you're teaching that art for the betterment of other people to use that art in other ways if they can, or after your patent expires, you had the advantage of 20 years, but now people can use that to continue advancements after that 20 year period. I hope I answered that for you, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, I've got one uh, question just came up in chat. Um, what's on me? You, you're welcome to. Well, I'm, I'm afraid of. Oh, okay. Let me read it then. How about here? Uh, are the skills required to become an inventor the kind of skills that one develops in the workplace? And should they be taught at a universities? Both. Uh, university is a great background. Uh, uh, Jim, you know this, I didn't have the advantage of a university uh, background to myself. Yeah. I had just years of industry experience, but it, it was a combination of learning from people that were very intelligent uh, and applying the industry science that I brought to the table. So everything that I've always done is in a team environment. Uh, I'm not the engineer of record on any of the inventions. I've always had a team behind me that can take the ideas and run with them. So I think the university background teaches you the format. It teaches you the science and what makes something novel or inventive. And then the industry side tells you whether it has value, whether you should be investing in it, uh, and whether it's marketable. So it's a combination of both. And, and I love people to have a good background in engineering. And then you send them out. I'm sending one of my engineers to a customer tomorrow um, down in North Carolina, just to see the use of competitors products under a problem statement that we have. I have a problem statement from a customer and I'm putting an engineer on a plane. He's never been to a job site for this reason before. And he's gonna go down there and he's gonna look at this site and see what their problems are with this technology and his assignment is to develop a new technology uh, that will solve these problems but I got to send him out to the field I got to give him industry experience he's, he's a very smart engineer but he needs he needs that field experience as well so it's a combination of both okay uh, another question that's come in here um, 
What would you say is the most important factor in gaining AHJ buy-in for a new product or approach? A hundred percent. The HJ will make or break. Uh, if you've got an AHJ that just puts a head in the sand and says, until I see it in black and white, in my standard, I don't accept any equivalent method. Usually it's a fear factor. It's a fear factor from the HJ. They don't understand the basis of what is equivalent or not. So they're just not comfortable in accepting an equivalent method. Um, but getting the buy-in of an AHJ or an insurance carrier is critical. Critical to, I can't, I can't put a high enough emphasis on it. And that's why if you're gonna be in the inventive, if you're gonna be in the innovative or the lanes of bringing new products to market, you have to participate in their environment. You can't be a stranger and just come in heavy handed once you have a product and say, you're going to accept this. They need to recognize you, recognize your brand, your company of, of being technical speakers at their symposiums, of being in the circuit that they're involved with, because then they have a little bit more familiarity with you and a trust level to you that if you say something's equivalent or you're bringing them data, at least they know who you are. It's that circle that you build over time. So huge importance to have the HJ insurance buy-in. Otherwise it's a no-go. They have the right to say no. It, it says right in those standards subject to the authority having jurisdiction saying it's acceptable. If they say no, it's over. And you have to wait until you get black and white and that could be the six to 10 years. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any final questions? I don't see any hands raised. Nothing else in chat. Um, any final That's questions? I, I know the signal of final questions, Jim, from our <laughs> from our past. So I'm I'm just going to say thank you for your time today. It was a very kind.